all of you uh, from the Arab Center for Research and uh, Policy Studies. I'm Mehran Kamrava, Director of the Iranian Studies Unit here and also Professor of Government at Georgetown University uh, here in Qatar. Our, our lecture today will look at Iran's evolving regional strategy uh, a topic that is of tremendous importance and relevance um, uh, these days. Well, it's always important and relevant. And I cannot possibly think of a better person uh, to walk us through this than our, our guest today, Dr. Sanam Vakil, a good old friend. I was thinking today as to when we met last time, and I think it was approximately 15, 16 years ago at uh, one of the conferences, and I've been following uh, Sanam's work ever since. Sanam Vakil is the director of the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House in England. She was previously the program's deputy director and senior research fellow and led projects on Iran and Gulf Arab dynamics. She's also the James Anderson professorial lecturer uh, in Middle Eastern studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of uh, Advanced International Studies in Bologna. Professorial lecturer, incidentally, is also a title that the president of Georgetown University holds. So uh, you're in company with the president of Georgetown University. I will, I will just say that's a nicer title for adjunct. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <so you> well, <laughs> um, uh, Sanam, uh, uh, Sanam's research focuses on regional security, Gulf geopolitics, and future trends in Iran's domestic and foreign policy. So please join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Sanam Vakil. Thank you so much, um, Mehran John. It's such a real pleasure to be here, um, and, an, and an honor to be invited um, by uh, Dr. Kamrava, who I have admired um, his work. I've, I've been a student uh, for many years. Um, I think that uh, we're very privileged um, as academics and analysts um, to have such a wealth of scholarship um, in, in the field of Iran, uh, Middle East, Gulf studies, and I have to say that uh, Dr. Kamrava is uh, one of those that I hold on a, a, a very high mantle. So I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Thank you uh, to you and to the Doha Institute um, for having me. Um, and of course, uh, you're quite right. It's a timely discussion to be thinking about Iran. But uh, for those of us that look at Iran, it's always timely. Um, and I look forward to the day when it's not timely. Uh, so I wonder if that will ever happen. Um, I uh, have prepared some slides and, and um, we'll be discussing sort of trends that uh, we have sort of observed in, in project work at Chatham House that looks at how um, Iran is um, adapting as a state um, and shifting its sort of regional approach. Um, this is uh, work that uh, builds on um, it, key informant interviews, workshops, conversations uh, that we hold under the very famous Chatham House rule. Um, it's work that is evolving and, of course, doesn't flu um, fully capture um, the shifts that we've seen in the region since October 7th, uh, the tragic events and, and the horrific uh, war that we're seeing um, play out today in Gaza. Um, but uh, my aim is to really explore how uh, Iran reacts and adapts to the changing uh, regional landscape, um, not to necessarily be predictive, uh, but uh, to help us think about Iran um, as a state, as a state actor, um, but also maybe look inside the state to try to understand its threat perceptions um, and uh, its tactics um, as well. Um, a lot of our work, of course, builds on the scholarship of um, many myriad of academics and scholars um, that are uh, contributing uh, to the field of Iranian studies. 
Um, and uh, I think that, um, again, we are uh, really privileged to have some fantastic um, analysts and scholars out there constantly thinking and producing uh, work on Iran. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be part of the community of Iran scholars. And, and of course, it's great to see um, so many people here in the room today. Um, sorry. Uh, how do I move the slides? Sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, just to sort of set the scene, and, and this is, of course, um, what the region very much looked like prior to October 7th, I think um, we should um, consider uh, the, the landscape in the region um, prior uh, to the war um, and uh, reflect on the fact that uh, regional states um, across the Middle East uh, were engaging in uh, a reset, as has been described by many analysts and academics, um, myself included. Um, states had perhaps been exhausted uh, by a period uh, over a decade-long conflict, civil wars um, that hadn't been completely resolved in, in Syria, Libya, Yemen, um, uh, and, and Iraq, t to be exact, and, and conflicts uh, pertaining to non-state actors. But um, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, there was a, a clear shift in strategy underway. Um, efforts were made uh, to restore uh, um, diplomatic ties across the GCC. We saw Turkey um, renew relationships with the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Syria has been uh, rehabilitated. Um, Iran and Saudi Arabia, of course. Um, also have uh, restored ties. These are some of the dynamics and trends we were seeing. And alongside that, of course, uh, we also witnessed um, in 2020 a sort of shift in patterns um, where uh, Israel was slowly also being integrated into the regional landscape. Much of these shifts have been um, perhaps driven by um, concerns about uh, the U.S. Uh, and its role in the region as a traditional security guarantor. That uh, shifts in the U.S. have been um, underway now for at least three U.S. administrations, where there have been sort of domestic priorities um, overtaking uh, regional influence and regional um, commitments uh, to the region. Uh, you've heard a number of U.S. presidents talk about forever wars. And of course, we witnessed uh, the very dramatic and shocking U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021. Um, and, and these shifting US commitments, of course, um, has caused alarm and anxiety in parts of the region. Um, but of course, in Iran, for example, uh, uh, the deprioritization of, of the US commitments to the region uh, is seen perhaps in a, in a different light um, and, and perhaps um, in a more positive uh, light. Additionally, of course, uh, let's not forget, we went through COVID. We don't talk about it anymore. But uh, it was a profound period, a difficult period globally. And it was a difficult period for the region with stark lock lockdowns, high death tolls. Um, and uh, coming out of COVID, um, it became clear uh, that uh, regional states from Turkey to Iran uh, to the Gulf were uh, recommitting and prioritizing um, their domestic economies. And so there was some rethinking taking place in the region uh, that economic revitalization um, should be tied to perhaps greater uh, regional diplomacy, and if not, regional integration. Um, beyond that, of course, um, at, a, at a macro or, or more global s scale, we have seen um, increased tensions uh, between the United States and, and, and China um, very overtly um, or over two US administrations. And specifically, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, has uh, also exposed um, tensions and vulnerabilities um, at the geopolitical level. Um, that has perhaps reduced bandwidth um, and has had other knock-on consequences. Um, but these uh, shifts um, have very much um, impacted uh, the Middle Eastern landscape. Of course, this landscape is fluid and evolving. Um, but uh, you know, these trends, I think, come together um, 
and and we could be, you know, sort of in the middle of um, uh, shifts uh, pertaining to um, the role and revel relevance of um, external players in the Middle East and the empowerment of uh, regional states and regional actors in, in managing uh, Middle Eastern security. Might be too early to make those predictions, but um, uh, you know, these are some of the dynamics um, that I see um, underway. And when we think about Iran in particular, um, and this is sort of an amalgamation of uh, Iran's security priorities um, over a 45-year period, the Islamic Republic of Iran is coming up and celebrating its 45th birthday. Um, and um, there are certain consistencies in Iran's regional security um, uh, priorities and, and threat perceptions. And of course, others are fluctuating. Um, but mainly, um, the, the primary motivation of the Islamic Islamic Republic is regime survival. Um, and to maintain uh, the cohesion and unity of the regime, um, the system, the political establishment focuses on uh, its security and stability above all. I think understanding and digesting that is of huge importance. Um, particularly in the context of um, the past 110 days and the war where many people sort of misinterpret or um, overestimate what Iran's motives and obje objectives are. Um, Iran is primarily driven by its own self-preservation. The system is, um, these are its goals. And so um, putting that number one and understanding how important that is uh, can help explain how and when and why uh, Iran maneuvers. Um, as part of that uh, um, goal, of course, Iran um, seeks to transfer or push its threats as far away from its borders and its territory. This is a, a strategy of uh, or pursuit of strategic depth that Iran has developed. Um, through uh, a, a number of asymmetrical investments. Um, these investments today are, 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 are bearing fruit, and, and we've watched the axis of resistance um, develop into uh, what uh, could be uh, more of a transnational regional force. I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but uh, this uh, forward defense um, strategy um, is very much designed to uh, provide Iran with low-cost power projection and deterrence. Um, it's important to remember that uh, Iran uh, does not have a conventional military force, um, and so its investment in asymmetrical um, deterrence capability helps Iran manage uh, in a defensive way, and it sees itself um, in a defensive way in the region, although it behaves in an offensive way um, as um, uh, a state that has to uh, project power um, abroad in order to protect its security uh, back home. Um, beyond that, um, uh, Iran, uh, through this policy, but also through direct diplomacy and, and, and bilateral relations, it tries to expand its base of support around the region. Uh, for 45 years, Iran um, has been uncomfortable with its geography, and I think its neighbors have been uncomfortable with Iran's geography. Today, we might be in a place where everyone has accepted that nobody is up and moving countries or moving uh, to other parts of the world. Um, and we're seeing a different dynamic and tone about engagement and diplomacy and dialogue as being very important to managing threats and managing relations. But Iran has conventionally seen itself as isolated. Um, isolated, of course, because it is um, by its own perceived threats, um, threats being uh, primarily the United States above all. Second, of course, Israel's um, posture and presence in the region. Um, uh, the uh, Iranian academic Nasser Hadian also says regional chaos is a threat for Iran. And so Iran tries to manage. Um, those uh, regional shifting dynamics. And of course, Iran is um, very uh, much driven by uh, the presence of terror groups in the region um, that um, have uh, risen and um, uh, pushed back against Iran's influence across, um, across the Middle East. And we have seen as recently as January 3rd, um, ISIS-backed terrorist attacks in Kerman, um, so within Iran, striking not Iran um, in, in its um, areas of influence abroad, but inside Iran. And so um, that in itself highlights um, a threat for the Islamic Republic. Um, th uh, these are not listed in particular order, but I think that um, also it's important to consider that because the Islamic Republic is under serious and significant sanctions, um, has been since 1979, but particularly 
since the, Bush, uh, since the Trump administration imposed maximum pressure sanctions on Iran, Iran has been looking to manage, um, uh, gain access to liquidity and markets and keep its economy alive. It is not um, in, a, in a development posture. Uh, I would say the Islamic Republic's economy has been contracting for a number of years now, um, but uh, this, is, this is not about uh, thriving. Uh, this is about surviving. Um, so uh, that has become a very important priority, and I think it um, helps to explain um, uh, some of the, the shifts and outreach that Iran has made um, over the course of, of the past few years. Um, Iran also seeks to manage emergent threats, so it is ev strategically directed to maintaining security and stability, but tactically it is always shifting. Um, and reacting uh, to the landscape and, and to um, uh, its opponents or its adversaries uh, across, th uh, across the region. And so that, I think, is also important to keep in mind. Um, this is a slide uh, dating um, back uh, to the time period of the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq um, over 20 years ago. Um, but I, um, I bring it to your attention um, because I, um, I like to show this slide just so that we can imagine and think about uh, or to better appreciate um, threat perceptions and how countries react. I think it's important to situate ourselves in, in, um, in their worldview and thinking. And this is what um, it felt like uh, for many years for uh, Iranian political leaders and strategic thinkers and, 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 and the military, IRGC, um, for example, inside Iran. All of the uh, stars across um, our US bases, and there was a sense for a profound period of time that the Islamic Republic was encircled. And, and you will remember um, the period of the axis of evil. You will remember the US invasion, um, or hopefully you will remember the US invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and there was a per perception for um, a period of time um, that Iran was going to be next on the map. And, and in, in the period of the Bush administration, uh, there was also a, th a theory, a, a domino theory, that um, the uh, investment and, and the sort of invasion of these two countries would lead to uh, the transfer of democracy that would flow across the Middle East. Um, that was quite long ago, and we haven't seen that transpire in the way that um, the uh, compassionate conservatism of the Bush administration um, uh, sought uh, to achieve. But um, situating Iran's worldview in our minds, I think, is important um, because uh, it, it, this period of time put uh, Iran in a particularly defensive posture. Um, and I think uh, Iran um, reacting to the environment um, adjusted uh, during this period of time uh, how uh, it operated, um, and, it, and it led to um, actually uh, what I would describe a period of growth for Iran. Immediately, of course, the the U.S. invasion in 2003, there was a period of weakness, and that period of weakness, uh, we might say, lasted from 2003 uh, to circa 2006, uh, when you might remember um, there was a, a war for 34 days between Israel and Lebanon. Hezbollah in particular, um, but from 2006 on, Iran began to expand and, and, and take advantage of regional shifts, um, uh, moving from a period of contraction or defensiveness uh, to uh, a bit more growth um, uh, strategically in the region. Um, and this uh, is an interesting slide from uh, IISS um, that just shows um, how over uh, the course of the past four decades, and, and this hasn't been uh, a plan in a box, um, but a development um, strategy over a number of decades, how Iran has um, executed its uh, forward defense strategy through uh, the creation of proxy groups across the region. It just sort of visual gives you a visual of um, Iran's relationships across the region, um, having supported Hezbollah since the early 1980s, um, having developed um, ties with the Houthis um, in, in Yemen um, since the late 1990s, uh, strengthening ties that have been on again, off again uh, with Palestinian groups, particularly in Gaza, um, and, and those tensions again have been on and off, and Iran has tried to build um, 
as well as work with groups um, through through moments of difficulty. Uh, it has had long time um, relations with the Syrian uh, regime. Um, dating back uh, to the 1970s, but particularly during the period of the Arab Spring um, in 2011, uh, Iran um, e extended itself um, and came to the defense of, of Bashar al-Assad uh, during, during um, uh, the period of, of civil dissent um, and used that period to entrench itself also in Syria. Um, and, and so, you know, this is a period where we see uh, Iran's growth, um, and that growth period was important, uh, again, to project strength um, across um, Israel's borders, perhaps to push back against the presence of terror groups, which is a, a lot of the justification that the Islamic Republic uses to support a longtime traditional friend, um, the Syrian state, um, and, of course, uh, to uh, build greater uh, ties and fluidity um, between Hezbollah, Syria, and Iran, which um, has, has played out um, in much more of a meaningful way today. Uh, in Iraq, um, also, since, uh, since the um, American um, presence in Iraq, um, Iran has been slowly cultivating and, and developing ties um, in the country, uh, particularly um, uh, took a, a much more aggressive posture against American troops, um, uh, effectively from 2005 onwards, um, building capacity and building militias across the country. But it was the emergence of ISIS and Daesh in, in 2014 that saw Iran again take advantage of weaknesses um, and, um, and the terror threat in Iraq to mobilize in particular um, and uh, support uh, um, Hashd al-Shabi groups in Iraq. Um, and uh, those groups um, have uh, become an important part of uh, Iran's um, uh, network. Uh, these groups are not uh, by any means cohesive or united, um, and, um, uh, but they remain important uh, to uh, the network of influence. And this is sort of a broader picture. You know, people want to put numbers um, behind the axis of resistance. Um, and mind you, the name axis of resistance, important to note, you know, emerge in reaction to uh, President Bush's reference of the axis of evil. Uh, so this is more or less estimates of what the axis of resistance could be today. We don't have accurate assessments. Um, and it's important to remember uh, that these groups, um, uh, you know, while um, uh, may maybe um, coming together as an axis of resistance that share sort of similar ideological goals, um, each operate within their own domestic context. And, and I think that uh, one of the outcomes or takeaways since October uh, 7th is that we're going to have a better understanding of how the, how the axis of re resistance um, operationalizes and coordinates, which has not been really brought to light um, over, over the past few years. Um, but uh, it, it's very important to understand because the, the axis has not just ideational um, configuration and alignment, obviously also uh, military capabilities, uh, but they also share, um, share um, and, and train each other, share um, information on um, soft, um, soft wars, uh, uh, promote uh, um, each other's narratives um, on social media, and of course, uh, share capabilities and, and, um, and train. And so it's important to see how um, the axis um, will operationalize going forward. This is just one more graphic, again, um, uh, to show you um, the presence of these groups now today. Um, we can see the sort of uh, geographic significance uh, of their positioning, um, uh, posture on the Straits of Hormuz, obviously on the Bab al-Mandeb and the Red Sea. Um, uh, but a And this looks very strategic, doesn't it? Um, it looks like there was a grand plan, um, um, but I, I would argue that there wasn't. Um, again, there have been periods of growth and, and contraction that Iran has taken advantage of. Um, and um, we are in an interesting period where we'll see if this strategy um, will hold. So um, back, uh, back to sort of the periods of growth and contraction. 
Um, there was a period of growth where, that I explained where Iran invested in um, its forward defense strategy um, uh, with greater um, rigor, and, and, and this was very much led by um, the leadership of Qasem Soleimani, who um, uh, I think much to his own dismay was outed uh, by the New Yorker um, writer Dexter Filkins, who called him the shadow commander, um, and everyone began to pay attention to who he was. Um, and, and Qasem Soleimani very much managed the network in a personal way. He had personal relationships, and, and um, he used those personal relationships to sort of push groups around, and it seemed much more of a command and control structure. Um, but, um, of course, uh, I, I, while Iran looks like, uh, again, it's strategic, uh, Iran was very much reacting uh, to events in the region. Um, and there was a period, I think, um, after these investments that Iran began to experience a number of setbacks across the Middle East. Um, and these setbacks are important to understand uh, because through this period of time, while Iran was investing um, in uh, its uh, defensive strategic posture, um, it was also trying to um, push the U.S. Uh, out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it was also, um, at the same time, negotiating uh, the JCPOA. Um, and uh, after over a 10-year period of uh, engagement um, and thinking that sanctions relief was going to come to Iran, um, uh, you know, Iran felt like it was in a position um, of strength. Uh, but you will remember that, um, again, a, a number of things happen. Um, in uh, 2018, President Trump announced uh, the U.S. withdrawal from the JCPOA, um, and of course uh, th that resulted in maximum pressure sanctions and, and the complete um, a disconnect of the Iranian economy um, from uh, European investment, uh, and, and this has had long-term consequences uh, for the Islamic Republic that thought it could um, uh, open its economy and encourage um, investment from, uh, from Europe um, uh, over time. Secondly, of course, again, the U.S. has continued to shift its priorities, which I've already discussed, uh, and this has um, opened space for Iran to exploit um, in, um, in maybe asserting itself uh, more boldly uh, with its uh, neighbors. Um, you will remember that in 2019 and 2020, Iran was much more aggressive in, in attacks um, in the Persian Gulf or on the high seas, um, also stri being behind uh, attacks on Saudi oil facilities in Upkeg, for example. So there was a period of heightened tension that also saw less responsiveness from the United States, and I think uh, that was uh, important in, in um, strategic calculations. Um, we also saw a growing shift uh, in Israel's uh, greater regional integration through the Abraham Accords and the, um, the execution of Israel's octopus strategy, which um, saw Israel develop uh, greater intelligence bases in, in uh, Kurdistan, but also um, strengthen its ties with Azerbaijan. And through that period of time, Israel and Iran's shadow war was very much heating up. Uh, there was the killing of Iran's nuclear scientist, um, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, in 2020. Um, in fact, you know, over this period, there were at least uh, 10 um, 10 assassinations, drone strikes, cyber attacks uh, within Iran itself. So um, Iran uh, had a sense that uh, Israeli activism and, and the octopus strategy um, was uh, pushing back against Iran's forward defense strategy as well. Um, uh, and, and then in the region, um, Iran uh, not being uh, you know, the most productive or positive investor um, uh, was having setbacks. Uh, there, was, uh, there were protests against Iran's presence in uh, Iraq and Lebanon, in particular in 2019 um, and 2020. Um, and additionally, uh, you know, we should not forget um, that uh, on January 3rd, 2020, um, Qasem Soleimani uh, was assassinated um, and killed by the U.S. alongside Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, um, who was also instrumental in managing the axis of resistance. And so um, 
we're quite of the belief um, through a bit of the research that we've done um, that all of those um, have led to um, a, a sort of new recalibration of Iran's priorities in the region, still very much directed to regime survival, security and stability. Um, but since 2020, um, Iran has sort of shifted the management of the axis of resistance. Uh, it had new leadership under Esmail Ghani. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of uh, rumors and concerns that Ghani you know, is in Soleimani. Well, Obviously, he is in Soleimani. He has a different sort of leadership model. Um, and there has been uh, quite a, a degree of suggestion and, and discussions we've had across the region that um, the leadership model it has shifted to a more decentralized approach that empowers the axis of resistance much more. Um, relies more on Hezbollah as um, a key uh, interlocutor and partner, um, not a dependent of the Islamic Republic. Um, Hassan Nasrallah and Hezbollah does much more um, in in the axis uh, that is than is oftentimes described. Uh, has been a very important interlocutor not just um, in Syria um, and Iraq, but also in Yemen. Um, and part of this sort of decentralization is also to build interdependence among the groups. Uh, to share capacity, to build capabilities, to support uh, um, and enable um, the um, axis of resistance in preparation for a broader conflict, per perhaps, um, that we might be seeing uh, play out today. Um, and finally, of course, I Iran, because of this period where it's, it, it experienced setbacks and was under attack um, in, in the domestic environments where uh, it was supporting groups, um, Iran began to seek more deliberate, um, uh, plausible deniability um, in its relationship with the axis of resistance. This is not a truly effective policy because we all know that Iran is a patron um, behind the scenes and a supporter um, of, of the axis of resistance. But being able to say that they were not directly um, involved in strikes um, has been part of um, of its uh, its approach. Um, additionally, during this period, um, because of the impact of sanctions, and we've seen uh, the statistics uh, of inflation uh, just mounting and rising, where today it's over 50 percent, but it, you know it's really grown from the period of uh, Khatami's, pre I mean Rouhani's presidency, where it was about 10 percent inflation to, to today, of course, um, uh, being uh, exorbitant uh, unemployment figures are not really even um, reflective of the reality on the ground in Iran, currency devaluations, and, and many rounds of protests. You will remember 2022, um, the uh, pro protests that were um, inspired by the uh, tragic death of Masa Amini, but we've seen protests in 2017. We've seen protests in 2019. We've seen protests again, obviously, in 2022. But if you map and track protests in Iran as um, there are a, a number of scholars who have written about this. There are hundreds of protests every year in Iran, and there's a lot of dissent expressed through protests in Iran. Um, and much of it is driven about uh, towards governance and accountability and, of course, the economy. So in reaction to economic pressures, um, there has, I think, been a calculated shift that has played out in two areas where Iran has really um, shifted away um, from uh, rehabilitating ties with Europe um, aim uh, is no longer trying to uh, maintain um, economic engagement uh, with a part of the world that remains closed off to it. I think it is aware um, that European um, companies um, uh, are, are not going to be coming back to Iran, um, aware of the risk, aware of the prohibitive hurdles um, that are required to do business in Iran. And, and what we've seen is that Iran, for the first time, is making a, you know, maybe not the first time, but has been made, uh, made clear a decisive sh shift um, where Eastern ties, uh, with ties uh, with China and Asian countries are much more important uh, for the Iranian economy. And, and of course, this moves away from the original thinking where Iran was non-aligned, where Iran was not neither East nor West, but actually here today we're seeing uh, it's about the East, not the West. And, and Iran, uh, of course, ties that into its broader calculus with the US um, perhaps shifting its posture. 
Um, and so it's, it's sort of trying to take advantage there um, opportunistically. Um, and then finally, I would say um, part of its uh, outreach um, and efforts to restore ties um, regionally have been very important, um, uh, and particularly in, in um, the GCC. Uh, since, um, since 2019, uh, there have been a very clear efforts to uh, restore bilateral relations that were broken in 20. 2016 um, with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and Iran um, has a particular approach that it takes uh, here in the Gulf, uh, a lot of pressure, um, but also um, believes that uh, direct diplomacy um, is the way forward to exert um, influence um, across the GCC. Uh, it also tries to to prevent too much unity in the GCC um, towards Iran. Um, and you know what we have seen over the past few years is that Iran has um, restored these relations uh, as part of its effort uh, to um, gradually build um, economic bridges, um, again, that will help the economy um, uh, above all. Uh, these don't necessarily bear fruit in, in very transparent ways, um, but uh, they allow for Iran uh, to keep its economy afloat. Um, so uh, th these are just sort of some of the shifts that we're seeing, um, really to just describe that Iran um, is uh, very adaptive um, and, and is responsive to regional shifts, geopolitical shifts, um, and is constantly um, updating uh, its regional model. Um, I, I think that we are uh, perhaps in a, in a period of, of flux um, right now uh, with uh, the Gaza war underway, and we've seen an immense amount of tension. And, and of course, we could easily be sliding into um, a broader regional conflict. Um, but taking account these regional shifts, I think it's um, important to, um, you know, consider uh, these threat perceptions, Iran's primary strategic objective of survival, uh, but also um, how it operates in sort of anticipating um, the, the system's next moves and, um, of course, um, also considering where its strengths and weaknesses are. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanam. That was great. Uh, we all know that uh, understanding uh, Iran's uh, regional strategy is difficult, and explaining it is even more difficult. So uh, thank you very much for that uh, very concise and, um, and uh, detailed uh, look. Um, I'm sure there are questions, um, but um, if I may just start off. Uh, um, just a couple of days ago, we saw this um, uh, Israeli attack in Damascus that killed four Iranian uh, IRGC commanders that came days after Iran apparently killed four mo uh, high-level Mossad operatives in Kurdistan. So um, has an Iranian-Israeli war actually already started? Or where are we with that? Um, if you can just start with that. Thanks, Mehran, with the hard question first. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I would like to say yes. Um, I think we're, we're watching it play out in slow motion. Um, and I think the anticipation is that it will um, play out over the course of this year. Um, and it will take different dimensions. Uh, certainly, um, you know, we could categorize this as a return to the gray war, the gray zone operations that um, we did witness for a period of time that were cyber um, direct attacks across the region. And uh, what we haven't yet seen, of course, are Israeli operations um, inside Iran in a meaningful way. Um, but I think that the Islamic Republic anticipates that this is where we are going. Um, the problem I see, though, is um, I think that uh, Iran is in a period where it, it, it's not maneuvering. It doesn't have as much room to maneuver. Um, it, it doesn't seek a broader direct confrontation, um, I think, at a military level with Israel. 
it doesn't want to see uh, the U.S. engage further in the region, um, uh, and it wants to preserve the axis of resistance, um, the network, and its capabilities as best as it can. Um, so, uh, and it's not an effective. It's not particularly effective in its sort of revenge operations. Um, if you if you note that um, after Ker the Kerman attack, um, you know there were statements of uh, of revenge, and we still haven't uh, um, um, taken revenge over the death of Qasem Soleimani. So, um, you know, this is not where Iran excels. Um, so, I, I'm a bit worried um, that in in this moment there will be quite a degree of miscalculation. And and if you'll remember just a few days ago, sorry, um, the days are blurring, blurring together now, um, when Iran hit uh, Idlib, Erbil, and uh, Pakistan in, in, in a 24-hour period, I think that was an alarming display of um, uh, military activity that we haven't seen from the Islamic Republic. Uh, 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 normally, it sort of uh, um, exports that kind of um, activity to other groups, its direct involvement supposedly to um, uh, reinforce deterrence, I think uh, sort of showcased uh, a bit of alarming behavior that I think um, maybe shows it has less maneuverability than, um, than it would like. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fereha. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and thanks, Mahran, for asking my first question. So here is my second question. <laughs> <laughs> my second question is on Gaza. Um, and in particular, how far Iran is going to go with this strategy on Gaza, uh, even my uh, question particularly about a threshold, if we reach it in the coming months, of uh, possibly seeing Hamas being removed as a one of the axes of resistance um, in Gaza. If we reach that threshold, as the Israeli government insists that this is going to be the ultimate and only and sole objective there. Are we going to, ex to see a larger Iranian or a shift in Iranian or an evolving or an adapting strategy from Iran? For example, uh, large scale intervention from Hezbollah in Lebanon or possibly direct intervention from Iran. Will Iran maintain its current strategy if Hamas on the verge of being removed from Gaza? Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Another tough question. Hard to be predictive <laughs> on this. <laughs> um, I mean, I think Iran has a few aims. Um, obviously, it wants to be seen as uh, the very key player uh, that is trying to end the war in Gaza. Um, above all, second aim, to keep the axis of resistance as intact as possible. Um, but there is a hierarchy uh, within the axis of resistance that perhaps isn't discussed. <laughs> um, and I don't think... Um, uh, you know, Hezbollah is the most important partner, um, and, and I think the key um, key uh, relationship for Iran. Uh, Iran, yeah, I, I don't know if it would mobilize to protect Hezbollah, um, uh, and in fact, I would struggle to think it would. Um, however. I, I don't think it would mobilize militarily uh, to protect Hamas. I think um, ha Iran's strategy, of course, is to try to preserve Hamas, uh, Hamas's network for as long as possible. Um, I think the key is, though, Iran operates on a um, on a network basis, it's also quite individual in how it maintains relationships. So um, it will cultivate the network again, uh, even if uh, Israel achieves its war aims and eradicates uh, uh, 30,000 members of Hamas, uh, Iran anticipates that there will still be enough um, uh, support or there will be opportunities for, for Iran to build back some of that uh, resistance network over time. Um, but I think certainly um, the calculation is to find a way to bring Hezbollah into whatever comes next um, in, um, uh, in, in the Palestinian process, if we can imagine what that will look like. Um, I, I, I struggle to see Iran directly um, engaging in a military way for any, um, any members of the group, potentially Hezbollah. Its primary motivation remains Iran. Thank you. Dr. Aisha. Thank you for your lecture. 
And uh, this is not a question or rather a comment. And if you agree with me, if, if you agree to, to let me disagree with your reading of the, the recent uh, attacks, triple attacks of uh, Iran in the region, uh, you, see, you see as if uh, as it's an evidence of uh, Iran not having a, a room for, for maneuver or an alarming behavior. And I see it rather another sign of the assertiveness of Iran. In fact, this is the first time that Iran would strike three countries with drones and missiles in 24 hours and claim responsibility for it. So uh, this is um, a different uh, reading. And I link it to, to also the, probably this is what, what I see is missing in the lecture, in the link between the regional strategy and the international ones. Um, recently, um, we've seen since last year, since the China brokered uh, deal, the rapprochement with, with Saudi Arabia, it gave Iran more assertiveness. And, and also, you can add to that the, um, the BRICS induction last year. And the last one, which is ongoing right now, I think is a very important move, which is um, the, the new treaty that uh, Iran is preparing to sign with Russia. So uh, if you link this element together, I think uh, what happened uh, recently, the, the so-called counter-terrorist attacks were rather a major sign that Iran might be able actually to face any threat militarily in the region and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Kamrava for his opinion on this, actually, also, if you don't mind. But let me just say, I, I appreciate um, that you see Iran as very confident. I think much of it is um, how you see Iran. Um, probably there is bias to my work. I, I am uh, Iranian born and um, I also see uh, Iran's domestic dynamics as, as feeding in to uh, um, its approach in the region. I don't see Iran as um, approaching its regional politics um, from a position of strength. I see Iran um, approaching uh, its, its regional activities in a defensive posture. And it looks like a victor, um, but uh, it, is, um, it, it, it's, it, it looks right now to me that Iran is tactically defensive. Um, and it, it might survive this. In fact, Iran always gets lucky and it's opportunistic and it builds its network from below, so it could always recapitalize it. Um, but it survives on the back of opportunities and weaknesses in the region or geopolitically, not because um, of its own um, operations. And, and so that's, uh, that's the sort of different prism of analysis that I bring to uh, my thinking of Iran. I also don't see China's role in brokering um, the deal with Iran and Saudi as, as, as in consequential. Um, I, uh, despite um, the importance of, of China there as a arbiter or as the Saudi government would like to see sort of a underwriter of the deal, I don't think China is going to assert itself too much against Iran. It operates within a very narrow reading of um, its own interests. Um, it continues to still be a beneficiary of the US presence in the region. It doesn't want to disrupt the order in the region because it's a beneficiary of the order. Um, so uh, I, you know, we, we might be moving to multipolarity, and Iran is certainly trying to encourage that um, through its uh, BRICS um, engagement and, and SCO engagement and, and other um, alignments in the region. But I, I think these are, uh, again, much more defensive and, and, and not not really productive investments. But Mehanjan, may I bring you into the conversation on this? How do you see Iran um, these days? Uh, well, uh, thank you. I, I feel um, uh, thoroughly unqualified to comment on this. But uh, uh, I fully expected, uh, Dr. Aisha, Iran to hit back at uh, bases in Iraq and in Syria, that uh, following what happened in Kerman. It would be a textbook example of Iranian behavior. But I was completely surprised when Iran hit Pakistan. And so one of the first things I did was uh, to reach out to people who I believe know more than, a lot more than I do. And a couple of things kind of stuck in my mind that I'll just share with you. Uh, a couple of preliminary thoughts stuck in my mind. One is that um, Iran's um, uh, 
uh, uh, hit on Pakistan was um, one school of thought, uh, I think, in Iran, is that it was uh, decided already. Uh, I just uh, finished a study, incidentally, I should preface by saying, I just finished a study on Iran's neighborhood policy. And Iran, good neighborly policy. And Iran always holds up its relations with Pakistan as a prime example of good neighborly relations. And in the, not in the week, but in the days before uh, the um, uh, Iranian attack uh, on the uh, outpost in Pakistan, a number of Pakistani um, uh, high-level officials, cabinet ministers actually, were in Tehran and they were deciding. So I naturally asked, what's going on? What are Iran's calculation? Two thoughts stood out. One is that this was already decided between Iran and Pakistan that uh, Iran would hit this base in um, uh, Sistan, in, in um, uh, Pakistani Baluchistan, and Pakistan would hit the base in uh, Iran's Sistan and Baluchistan. But Pakistan got really upset when Iran publicly announced it. It was not supposed to have been announced. That's one uh, school of thought. The other school of thought is that this is a classic case of what in Iran is known as the duality between diplomacy and uh, military. Actually, in Iran, they call it Maidan, which is the field, diplomacy and military field, uh, between Iran's uh, uh, foreign policy and the IRGC being in charge of security policy. And they didn't quite get the timing straight, and then Pakistan had to uh, hit back and had to, they just had to do something for domestic political purposes. And then, um, as of yesterday, uh, uh, apparently everything is restored and it's all good between these two neighbors and uh, uh, it's pre the attack days. So um, the, um, uh, there are different schools of thought as to why, but I don't think anybody, uh, at least those who I think know more than I do, see this as a demonstration of Iran's belligerence and overconfidence. They see it as uh, either a product of internal jockeying for position and influence or uh, a predetermined uh, strike that uh, somehow went awry because somebody in the IRGC decided they wanted to brag about it and then it, uh, it forced Pakistan's hand. I'll just add that... Um Buying into the argument that maybe it was pre-planned, um, there were uh, there were a number of IRGC that were killed in um, Baluchistan before Chris just before Christmas. Right, absolutely. And that would yeah. sort of lend to that argument that they right. were going to respond anyway right, to make exactly. it clear. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your lecture. Um, regarding, as you're saying. Um, the popular sentiment against Iran domestically. They squashed a lot of protests, as we've seen over the past year. Um, if this were to expand into a broader regional conflict and Iran is being targeted directly then by Israel and America, et cetera, how would it survive domestically among the population? How, how would the people react? Is there any chance of sort of that kind of uprising against the government at this point? Um, thank you. I mean, it's a good, it's a good thought exercise to try to consider. Um, I, I, I would just say that, um, you know, Iran is a very large country. Um, and, and, and I think its geography and its demography is often, um, not thought about. 85 million people. Um, and this is a system that, um, continues to demonstrate its willingness to use coercive force on its population. Um, I, um, I, I struggle to think that after last round of protests, um, which really um, demonstrated um, uh, the government's willing uh, yet again to be very brutal and repressive, um, but.
uh, also that um, uh, domestic uh, opposition or, or networks or groups r really um, are not yet coordinated um, in, in a meaningful way. And uh, the climate in Iran today is economically repressive, but of course politically repressive. I, I struggle to imagine that there would be um, a, a whole scale uh, revolution um, or, or revolt, um, not because it, uh, it, it can't it, it can't happen um, over time, but I think a lot of the uh, imp networks that need to be built and developed um, uh, are not there because the system is quite good at segregating civil society and leaders and and pressuring uh, ordinary people and of course jailing and dis um, uh, potential uh, leaders as well. So um, it, it's hard it's hard to see it right now. Uh, thank you, Sana. Our time has come to an end, but would you be gracious enough to take two more questions? Uh, we just had two late questions come in, and uh, so if I could beg the, for the questions to be brief and the response to be brief, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, great overview. I agree with you that Iran uh, is in defensive tactics when it comes to attacking targets in Iraq and in Pakistan. I think also Iran demonstrated, uh, flexed its muscles uh, when they targeted the house of the businessman in Erbil because the ballistic missiles were launched from Ahvaz. And if you look at the map, Ahvaz is too far away from where they, they could have targeted it from somewhere else, basically demonstrating that they have accurate uh, missiles. But I, I want to go back to Gaza. Uh, yes, there, there has been a shadow war between Israel and Iran. But at the same time, now um, I agree with you that also Iran is actually protective of Hezbollah. And now the uh, Ansar Allah al-Houthi, you know, they're doing something in the, in the Red Sea, trying to um, harm Israel, but you know, it's, it's not very much effective. What is next? What, what Iran is trying to achieve? Is it to disrupt the Israeli strategy in the region? Because Israel is basically intent on destroying Gaza and destroying Hamas. Obviously, they have done a lot of damage to Gaza and Hamas. And next, Hezbollah. This is their declared strategy. Do you think Iran is trying only to disrupt that, or is, or is it trying to do something else? Thank you. Um, well, I think in the same way that I would that I have sort of suggested that Iran is uh, much more tactical in how it approaches the regional landscape. I would say it's very clear since October 7 that Israel is also tactical. There is no strategy in the box. If it had one, it would have not um, allowed for Iran to become so embedded on its borders. And I think that's something we need to discuss and interrogate after our, um, the war comes to an end, how Israel's security strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran um, has also failed. Uh, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think that um, I, I'm not sure Israel has an Iran strategy right now. I think it, it, it is developing a longer term strategy, tactically trying to restore deterrence on its borders. Um, uh, I, I don't, I'm not of the view that Israel is seeking a, a broader war with Hezbollah, but um, it is aiming to push back Hezbollah over the Litani River um, and to call it a day. In the meantime, take advantage um, of, of the war to again um, uh, attack some um, individuals and push back against Iranian-backed groups in Syria and Iraq. Um, I think that's it in terms of uh, what's achievable in the short run. Uh, but over the course of this year, what we might see is um, a, a really serious heating up of tensions if Israel does develop a, a strategy, a strategy that is if, and this is a, another sort of asterisk, supported by um, the United States uh, to deal not just with um, the axis of resistance, but also Iran's nuclear program, because we didn't mention it, but that's also heating up and, and, and also uh, quite alarming. So um, we're in this moment of, of tactics. We, we just don't know where, it, where it's going right now. Perfect. Thank you. And the last question goes to Professor Kozanov. Thank you. Uh, just brief question. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned the uh, Iran's turn to the east. How sustainable it is? Uh, uh, is it? And uh, are we going to see anytime soon Iran trying to uh, common uh, to find common language with the United States on the region? Thank you. 
Thanks, Nikolai. Um, I think uh, it, Iran has no choice but to make it sustainable. These are not relationships that are going to, again, lead to the flourishing of the Iranian economy, but again, opportunities that Iran is just trying to uh, make uh, uh, you know, small bits of lemonade from, from the lemons that are there. So um, building that north-south transport corridor, um, transferring uh, some of its uh, drone capabilities to Russia. Limited um, opportunities, not uh, massive um, high levels of trade and growth and investment uh, can it be expected from the Russians and from the Chinese also. There, I Iran remains sanctioned. Um, and until it really uh, develops a strategy to unlock uh, it, it, its regional role um, and, and, and tensions with the US, it, it remains um, it, it remains constrained. I mean, I often think that Iran has checkmated a lot of its regional um, adversaries in the region, but ultimately the U.S. has checkmated Iran. Iran is locked in. There's only so much it can do, um, but it is trying to, to maneuver um, regionally to the best of its ability. We could sit here all day and uh, uh, listen to you and uh, talk about this, but unfortunately our time has come to an end. You have my sincere thanks, sincere thanks of the audience here and worldwide. Thank you very much, Anna. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And thank you all. Thank you.